Chapters 22 and 23 of Over the Top. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain and is read by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Over the Top by Arthur Empey. Chapter 22 Punishments and Machine Gun Stunts. Soon after my arrival in France, in fact from my enlistment, I had found that in the British Army discipline is very strict. One has to be very careful in order to stay on the narrow path of government virtue. There are about seven million ways of breaking the King's regulations. To keep one you have to break another. The worst punishment is death by a firing squad, or up against a wall, as Tommy calls it. This is for desertion, cowardice, mutiny, giving information to the enemy, destroying or willfully wasting ammunition, looting, rape, robbing the dead, forcing a safeguard, striking a superior, etc. Then comes the punishment of sixty-four days in the front-line trench without relief. During this time you have to engage in all raids, working parties in no man's land, and every hazardous undertaking that comes along. If you live through the sixty-four days, you are indeed lucky. This punishment is awarded when there is a doubt as to the willful guilt of a man who has committed an offence punishable by death. Then comes the famous Field Punishment Number 1. Tommy has nicknamed it Crucifixion. It means that a man is spread-eagled on a limber wheel two hours a day for twenty-one days. During this time he only gets water, bully beef, and biscuits for his chow. You get crucified for repeated minor offences. Next in order is field punishment number two. This is confinement in the clink, without blankets, getting water, bully beef, and biscuits for rations, and doing all the dirty work that can be found. This may be for twenty-four hours or twenty days, according to the gravity of the offense. Then comes pack drill, or defaulter's parade. This consists of drilling, mostly at the double, for two hours with full equipment. Tommy hates this, because it is hard work. Sometimes he fills his pack with straw to lighten it, and sometimes he gets caught. If he gets caught, he grouses at everything in general for twenty-one days, from the vantage point of a limber wheel. Next comes CB, meaning confined to barracks. This consists of staying in billets or barracks for twenty-four hours to seven days. You also get an occasional defaulter's parade and dirty jobs around the quarters. The sergeant major keeps what is known as the crime sheet. When a man commits an offence, he is crimed. That is, his name, number, and offence is entered on the crime sheet. Next day at 9 a.m. he goes to the orderly room before the captain, who either punishes him with C.B. or sends him before the O.C. or officer commanding the battalion. The captain of the company can only award C.B. Tommy many a time has thanked the king for making that provision in his regulations. To gain the title of a smart soldier, Tommy has to keep clear of the crime sheet, and you have to be darn smart to do it. I have been on it a few times, mostly for Yankee impudence. During our stay of two weeks in rest billets, our captain put us through a course of machine-gun drills, trying out new stunts and theories. After parades were over, our guns crews got together and also tried out some theories of their own in reference to handling guns. These courses had nothing to do with the advancement of the war, consisted mostly of causing tricky jams in the gun, and then the rest of the crew would endeavor to locate as quickly as possible the cause of the stoppage. This amused them for a few days, and then things came to a standstill. One of the boys on my gun claimed that he could play a tune while the gun was actually firing, and demonstrated this fact one day on the target range. We were very enthusiastic, and decided to become musicians. After constant practice, I have become quite expert in the tune entitled, All Conductors Have Big Feet. When I had mastered this tune, our two weeks' rest came to an end, and once again we went up the line and took over the sector in front of a wood. At this point, the German trenches ran around the base of a hill, on the top of which was a dense wood. This wood was infested with machine guns, which used to traverse our lines at will, and sweep the streets of a little village, where we were billeted while in reserve. 
There was one gun in particular which used to get our goats. It had the exact range of our elephant dugout entrance, and every evening, about the time rations were being brought up, its bullets would knock up the dust on the road. More than one Tommy went west or to Blighty by running into them. This gun got our nerves on edge, and Fritz seemed to know it, because he never gave us an hour's rest. Our reputation as machine gunners was at stake. We tried various ruses to locate and put this gun out of action, but each one proved to be a failure, and Fritz became a worse nuisance than ever. He was getting fresher and more careless every day, took all kinds of liberties with us, thought he was invincible. Then one of our crew got a brilliant idea, and we were all enthusiastic to put it to the test. Here was his scheme. When firing my gun, I was to play my tune, and Fritz, no doubt, would fall for it, try to imitate me as an added insult. This gunner and two others would try, by the sound, to locate Fritz and his gun. After having got the location, they would mount two machine guns in trees, in a little clump of woods, to the left of our cemetery, and while Fritz was in the middle of his lesson, would open up and trust to luck. By our calculations, it would take at least a week to pull off the stunt. If Fritz refused to swallow our bait, it would be impossible to locate his special gun, and that's the one we were after, because they all sound alike, a slow pup, pup, pup. Our prestige was hanging by a thread. In the battalion we had to endure all kinds of insults and fresh remarks as to our ability in silencing Fritz. Even to the battalion that German gun was a sore spot. Next day Fritz opened up as usual. I let him fire away for a while, and then butted in with my pup, 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 pup. I kept this up quite a while, using two belts of ammunition. Fritz had stopped firing to listen. Then he started in, sure enough. He had fallen for our game. His gun was trying to imitate mine. But at first he made a horrible mess of that tune. Again I butted in with a few bars and stopped. Then he tried to copy what I had played. He was a good sport, all right because his bullets were going away over our heads, must have been firing into the air. I commenced to feel friendly toward him. This duet went on for five days. Fritz was a good pupil, and learned rapidly, in fact got better than his teacher. I commenced to feel jealous. When he had completely mastered the tune, he started sweeping the road again, and we clicked it worse than ever. But he signed his death warrant by doing so, because my friendship turned to hate. Every time he fired, he played that tune, and we danced. The boys in the battalion gave us the ha-ha. They weren't in on our little frame-up. The originator of the ruse and the other two gunners had Fritz's location taped to the minute. They'd mounted their two guns, and also gave me the range. The next afternoon was set for the grand finale. Our three guns, with different elevations, had their fire so arranged that opening up together, their bullets would suddenly drop on Fritz like a hailstorm. About three the next day, Fritz started pup-pupping that tune. I blew a sharp blast on a whistle. It was the signal agreed upon. We turned loose, and Fritz's gun suddenly stopped in the middle of a bar. We had cooked his goose, and our ruse had worked. After firing two belts each to make sure of our job, we hurriedly dismounted our guns and took cover in the dugout. We knew what to expect soon. We didn't have to wait long. Three salvos of whiz-bangs came over from Fritz's artillery, a further confirmation that we had sent that musical machine-gunner on his westward-bound journey. That gun never bothered us again. We were the heroes of the battalion. Our captain congratulated us, said it was a neat piece of work, and consequently we were all puffed up over the stunt. There are several ways Tommy uses to disguise the location of his machine gun and get his range. Some of the most commonly used stunts are as follows. At night, when he mounts his gun over the top of his trench and wants to get the range of Fritz's trench, he adopts the method of what he terms getting the sparks. This consists of firing bursts from his gun until the bullets hit the German barbed wire. He can tell when they are hitting the wire, because a bullet when it hits a wire throws out a blue electric spark. Machine gun fire is very damaging to wire, and causes many a wiring party to go out at night when it is quiet, to repair the damage. 
To disguise the flare of his gun at night when firing, Tommy uses what is called a flare protector. This is a stovepipe arrangement which fits over the barrel casing of the gun and screens the spark from the right and left, but not from the front. So Tommy, always resourceful, adopts this scheme. About three feet or less in front of the gun, he drives two stakes into the ground about five feet apart. Across these stakes he stretches a curtain made out of empty sandbags, ripped open. He soaks this curtain in water and fires through it. The water prevents it catching fire and effectively screens the flare of the firing gun from the enemy. Sound is a valuable asset in locating a machine gun, but Tommy surmounts this obstacle by placing two machine guns about 100 to 150 yards apart. The gun on the right to cover with its fire the sector of the left gun, and the gun on the left to cover that of the right gun. This makes their fire cross. They are fired simultaneously. By this method it sounds like one gun firing and gives the Germans the impression that the gun is firing from a point midway between the guns, which are actually firing, and they accordingly shell that particular spot. The machine gunners chuckle and say, Fritz is a brainy boy. Not aff he ain't. But the men in our lines at the spot being shelled curse Fritz for his ignorance, and pass a few pert remarks down the line in reference to the machine gunners being windy and afraid to take their medicine. Chapter 23. Gas Attacks and Spies Three days after we had silenced Fritz, the Germans sent over gas. It did not catch us unawares, because the wind had been made to order, that is, it was blowing from the German trenches toward ours at the rate of about five miles per hour. Warnings had been passed down the trench to keep a sharp lookout for gas. We had a new man at the periscope, on this afternoon in question. I was sitting on the fire step, cleaning my rifle, when he called out to me, "'There's a sort of greenish-yellow cloud rolling along the ground out in front. It's coming—' but I waited for no more, grabbing my bayonet, which was detached from the rifle. I gave the alarm by banging an empty shell-case, which was hanging near the periscope. At the same instant, gongs started ringing down the trench, the signal for Tommy to don his respirator, or smoke helmet, as we call it. Gas travels quickly, so you must not lose any time. You generally have about eighteen or twenty seconds in which to adjust your gas helmet. A gas helmet is made of cloth treated with chemicals. There are two windows or glass eyes in it through which you can see. Inside there is a rubber-covered tube which goes in the mouth. You breathe through your nose. The gas, passing through the cloth helmet, is neutralized by the action of the chemicals. The foul air is exhaled through the tube in the mouth, this tube being so constructed that it prevents the inhaling of the outside air or gas. One helmet is good for five hours of the strongest gas. Each Tommy carries two of them slung around his shoulder in a waterproof canvas bag. He must wear this bag at all times, even when sleeping. To change a defective helmet, you take out the new one, hold your breath, pull the old one off, placing the new one over your head, tucking in the loose ends under the collar of your tunic. For a minute, pandemonium reigned in our trench. Tommies adjusting their helmets, bombers running here and there, and men turning out of the dugouts with fixed bayonets to man the fire step. Reinforcements were pouring out of the communication trenches. Our gun's crew were busy mounting the machine gun on the parapet and bringing up extra ammunition from the dugout. German gas is heavier than air and soon fills the trenches and dugouts, where it has been known to lurk for two or three days until the air is purified by means of large chemical sprayers. We had to work quickly, as Fritz generally follows the gas with an infantry attack. A company man on our right was too slow getting on his helmet. He sank to the ground, clutching at his throat, and after a few spasmatic seconds twisting, went west. He died. It was horrible to see him die, but we were powerless to help him. In the corner of a traverse, a little muddy cur-dog, one of the company's pets, was lying dead, with his two paws over his nose. It's the animals that suffer the most, the horses, mules, cattle, dogs, cats, and rats, they having no helmets to save them. 
Tommy does not sympathize with rats in a gas attack. At times, gas has been known to travel with dire results 15 miles behind the lines. A gas, or smoke helmet, as it is called, at the best is a vile-smelling thing, and it is not long before one gets a violent headache from wearing it. Our eighteen-pounders were bursting in no man's land, in an effort by the artillery to disperse the gas clouds. The fire step was lined with crouching men, bayonets fixed, and bombs near at hand to repel the expected attack. Our artillery had put a barrage of curtain fire on the German lines to try and break up their attack and keep back reinforcements. I trained my machine-gun on their trench, and its bullets were raking the parapet. Then over they came, bayonets glistening. In their respirators, which have a large snout in front, they looked like some horrible nightmare. All along our trench, rifles and machine-guns spoke. Our shrapnel was bursting over their heads. They went down in heaps, but new ones took the place of the fallen. Nothing could stop that mad rush. The Germans reached our barbed wire, which had previously been demolished by their shells. Then it was bomb against bomb, and the devil for all. Suddenly, my head seemed to burst from a loud crack in my ear. Then my head began to swim, throat got dry, and a heavy pressure on the lungs warned me that my helmet was leaking. Turning my gun over to number two, I changed helmets. The trench started to whine like a snake, and sandbags appeared to be floating in the air. The noise was horrible. I sank into the fire step. Needles seemed to be pricking my flesh. Then blackness. I was awakened by one of my mates removing my smoke helmet. How delicious that cool, fresh air felt in my lungs. A strong wind had arisen and dispersed the gas. They told me I had been out for three hours. They thought I was dead. The attack had been repulsed after a hard fight. Twice the Germans had gained a foothold in our trench, but had been driven out by counterattacks. The trench was filled with their dead and ours. Through a periscope I counted eighteen dead Germans in our wire. They were a ghastly sight in their horrible-looking respirators. I examined my first smoke helmet. A bullet had gone through it on the left side, just grazing my ear. The gas had penetrated through the hole made in the cloth. Out of our crew of six, we lost two killed and two wounded. That night we buried all of the dead, excepting those in no man's land. In death there is not much distinction, friend and foe are treated alike. After the wind had dispersed the gas, the RAMC got busy with their chemical sprayers, spraying out the dugouts and low parts of the trenches to dissipate any fumes of the German gas which may have been lurking in the same. Two days after the gas attack, I was sent to Division Headquarters, in answer to an order requesting that captains of units should detail a man whom they thought capable of passing an examination for the Divisional Intelligence Department. Before leaving for this assignment, I went along the front-line trench, saying good-bye to my mates and lording it over them, telling them that I had clicked a cushy job behind the lines, and how sorry I felt that they had to stay in the front line and argue out the war with Fritz. They were envious, but still good-natured, and as I left the trench to go to the rear, they shouted after me, "'Good luck, Yank, old boy! Don't forget to send back a few fags to your old mates!' I promised to do this, and left. I reported at headquarters with sixteen others, and passed the required examination. Out of the sixteen applicants, four were selected. I was highly elated, because I was, as I thought, in for a cushy job, back at the base." The next morning the four reported to Division Headquarters for instructions. Two of the men were sent to large towns in the rear of the lines with an easy job. When it came our turn, the officer told us we were good men and had passed a very creditable examination. My tin hat began to get too small for me, and I noted that the other man, Atwell by name, was sticking his chest out more than usual. The officer continued, I think I can use you two men to great advantage in the front line. Here are your orders and instructions, also the pass which gives you full authority as special MP detailed on intelligence work. Report at the front line according to your instructions. It is risky work, 
and I wish you both the best of luck. My heart dropped to zero, and Atwell's face was a study. We saluted and left. That wishing us the best of luck sounded very ominous in our ears. If he had said, I wish you both a swift and painless death, it would have been more to the point. When we had read our instructions, we knew we were in for it good and plenty. What Atwell said is not fit for publication, but I strongly seconded his opinion of the war, army, and divisional headquarters in general. After a bit, our spirits rose. We were full-fledged spy-catchers, because our instructions and orders said so. We immediately reported to the nearest French estaminet, and had several glasses of muddy water, which they called beer. After drinking our beer, we left the estaminet and hailed an empty ambulance. After showing the driver our passes, we got in. The driver was going to the part of the line where we had to report. The ambulance was a Ford and lived up to its reputation. How the wounded ever survived a ride in it was inexplicable to me. It was worse than riding on a gun carriage over a rocky road. The driver of the ambulance was a corporal of the RAMC, and he had the wind up. That is, he had an aversion to being under fire. I was riding on the seat with him while Atwell was sitting in the ambulance, with his legs hanging out of the back. As we passed through a shell-destroyed village, a mounted military policeman stopped us and informed the driver to be very careful when we got out on the open road, as it was very dangerous, because the Germans lately had acquired the habit of shelling it. The corporal asked the trooper if there was any other way around, and was informed that there was not. Upon this he got very nervous and wanted to turn back, but we insisted that he proceed, and explained to him that he would get into serious trouble with his commanding officer if he returned without orders. We wanted to ride, not walk. From his conversation we learned that he had recently come from England with a draft, and had never been under fire, hence his nervousness. We convinced him that there was not much danger, and he appeared greatly relieved. When we at last turned into the open road, we were not so confident. On each side there had been a line of trees, but now all that was left of them were torn and battered stumps. The fields on each side of the road were dotted with recent shell holes, and we passed several in the road itself. We had gone about half a mile when a shell came whistling through the air, and burst in a field about three hundred yards to our right. Another soon followed this one, and burst on the edge of the road about four hundred yards in front of us. I told the driver to throw in his speed clutch, as we must be in sight of the Germans. I knew the signs, that battery was ranging for us, and the quicker we got out of its zone of fire, the better. The driver was trembling like a leaf, and every minute I expected him to pile us up in the ditch. I preferred the German fire. In the back, Atwell was holding on to the straps for dear life, and was singing at the top of his voice, We beat you at the Marne, we beat you at the Aisne, we gave you hell at Neuve Chapelle, and here we are again. Just then we hit a small shell hole and nearly capsized. Upon a loud yell from the rear, I looked behind, and there was Atwell sitting in the middle of the road, shaking his fist at us. His equipment, which he had taken off upon getting into the ambulance, was strung out on the ground, and his rifle was in the ditch. I shouted to the driver to stop, and in his nervousness he put on the brakes. We nearly pitched out head first. But the applying of those brakes saved our lives. The next instant there was a blinding flash and a deafening report. All that I remember is that I was flying through the air, and wondering if I would land in a soft spot. Then the lights went out. When I came to, Atwell was pouring water on my head out of his bottle. On the other side of the road, the corporal was sitting, rubbing a lump on his forehead with his left hand, while his right arm was bound up in a blood-soaked bandage. He was moaning very loudly. I had an awful headache, and the skin on the left side of my face was full of gravel, and the blood was trickling from my nose. But that ambulance was turned over in the ditch, and was perforated with holes from fragments of the shell. One of the front wheels was slowly revolving, so I could not have been out for a long period. If Mr. Ford could have seen that car, his peace-at-any-price conviction would have been materially strengthened, 
and he would have immediately fitted out another peace ship. The shells were still screaming overhead, but the battery had raised its fire, and they were bursting in a little wood about half a mile from us. Atwell spoke up. I wish that officer hadn't wished us the best of luck. Then he commenced swearing. I couldn't help laughing, though my head was nigh to bursting. Slowly rising to my feet, I felt myself all over to make sure that there were no broken bones. But outside of a few bruises and scratches, I was all right. The corporal was still moaning, but more from shock than pain. A shell splinter had gone through the flesh of his right forearm. Atwell and I, from our first-aid pouches, put a tourniquet on his arm to stop the bleeding, and then gathered up our equipment. We realized that we were in a dangerous spot. At any minute a shell might drop on the road and finish us off. The village we had left was not very far, so we told the corporal he had better go back to it and get his arm dressed, and then report the fact of the destruction of the ambulance to the military police. He was well able to walk, so we set off in the direction of the village, while Atwell and I continued our way on foot. Without further mishap we arrived at our destination and reported to Brigade Headquarters for rations and billets. That night we slept in the battalion sergeant major's dugout. The next morning I went to a first aid post and had the gravel picked out of my face. The instructions we received from Division Headquarters read that we were out to catch spies, patrol trenches, search German dead, reconnoiter in no man's land, and take part in trench raids and prevent the robbing of the dead. I had a pass which would allow me to go anywhere at any time in the sector of the line held by our division. It also gave me authority to stop and search ambulances, motor lorries, wagons, and even officers and soldiers whenever my suspicions deemed it necessary. Atwell and I were allowed to work together or singly, it was left to our judgment. We decided to team up. Atwell was a good companion and very entertaining. He had an utter contempt for danger, but was not foolhardy. At swearing, he was a wonder. A cavalry regiment would have been proud of him. Though born in England, he had spent several years in New York. He was about six feet one and as strong as an ox. I am five feet five in height, so we looked like Bud Fisher's Mutt and Jeff, when together. We took up our quarters in a large dugout of the Royal Engineers, and mapped out our future actions. This dugout was on the edge of a large cemetery, and several times at night, in returning to it, we got many a fall, stumbling over the graves of English, French, and Germans. Atwell on these occasions never indulged in swearing, though at any other time, at the least stumble, he would turn the air blue. A certain section of our trenches was held by the Royal Irish Rifles. For several days a very strong rumour went the rounds that a German spy was in our midst. This spy was supposed to be dressed in the uniform of a British staff officer. Several stories had been told about an officer wearing a red band around his cap, who patrolled the front line and communication trenches, asking suspicious questions as to location of batteries, machine-gun emplacements, and trench mortars. If a shell dropped in a battery, or on a machine gun, or even near a dugout, the spy was blamed. The rumor gained such strength that an order was issued for all troops to immediately place under arrest anyone answering to the description of the spy. Atwell and I were on the qui vive. We constantly patrolled the trenches at night, and even in the day, but the spy always eluded us. One day, while in a communication trench, we were horrified to see our brigadier-general, Old Pepper, being brought down it by a big private of the Royal Irish Rifles. The general was walking in front, and the private with fixed bayonet was following him in the rear. We saluted as the general passed us. The Irishman had a broad grin on his face, and we could scarcely believe our eyes. The general was under arrest. After passing a few feet beyond us, the general turned, and said in a wrathful voice to Atwell, "'Tell this damned fool who I am. He's arrested me as a spy.' Atwell was speechless. The sentry butted in with, "'None of that gassin' out of you. Back to headquarters you goes, Mr. Fritz. Open that face of yours again, and I'll dent in your napper with the butt of me rifle.' The general's face was a sight to behold. He was fairly boiling over with rage." 
but he shut up. Atwell tried to get in front of the sentry to explain to him that it really was the general he had under arrest, but the sentry threatened to run his bayonet through him, and would have done it, too. So Atwell stepped aside and remained silent. I was nearly bursting with suppressed laughter. One word, and I would have exploded. It is not exactly diplomatic to laugh at your general in such a predicament. The sentry and his prisoner arrived at brigade headquarters with disastrous results to the sentry. The joke was that the general had personally issued the order for the spy's arrest. It was a habit of the general to walk through the trenches on rounds of inspection, unattended by any of his staff. The Irishman, being new in the regiment, had never seen the general before, so when he came across him alone in a communication trench, he promptly put him under arrest. Brigadier generals wear a red band around their caps. Next day we passed the Irishman tied to the wheel of a limber, the beginning of his sentence of twenty-one days, field punishment number one. Never before have I seen such a woebegone expression on a man's face. For several days Atwell and I made ourselves scarce around brigade headquarters. We did not want to meet the general. The spy was never caught. End of chapter. Chapter 24 of Over the Top. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain and is read by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Over the Top by Arthur Empey. Chapter 24. THE FIRING SQUAD A few days later I had orders to report back to divisional headquarters, about thirty kilometers behind the line. I reported to the APM, the assistant provost marshal. He told me to report to billet number 78 for quarters and rations. It was about eight o'clock at night, and I was tired and soon fell asleep in the straw of the billet. It was a miserable night outside cold, and a drizzly rain was falling. About two in the morning I was awakened by someone shaking me by the shoulder. Opening my eyes I saw a regimental sergeant major bending over me. He had a lighted lantern in his right hand. I started to ask him what was the matter, when he put his finger to his lips for silence and whispered, Get on your equipment, and without any noise, come with me. This greatly mystified me, but I obeyed his order. Outside of the billet I asked him what was up, but he shut me up with, "'Don't ask any questions. It's against orders. I don't know myself.' It was raining like the mischief. We splashed along a muddy road for about fifteen minutes, finally stopping at the entrance of what must have been an old barn. In the darkness I could hear pigs grunting, as if they had just been disturbed. In front of the door stood an officer in a Macintosh. The RSM went up to him, whispered something, and then left. This officer called to me, asked my name, number, and regiment, at the same time, in the light of a lantern he was holding, making a notation in a little book. When he had finished writing, he whispered, "'Go into that billet and wait orders, and no talking, understand?' I stumbled into the barn and sat on the floor in the darkness. I could see no one, but could hear men breathing and moving. They seemed nervous and restless. I know I was. During my wait, three other men entered. Then the officer poked his head in the door and ordered, Fall in, outside the billet, in single rank. We fell in, standing at ease. Then he commanded, Squad, shun, number. There were twelve of us. Right turn, left wheel, quick march. And away we went. The rain was trickling down my back, and I was shivering from the cold. With the officer leading, we must have marched over an hour, ploughing through the mud and occasionally stumbling into a shell hole in the road, when suddenly the officer made a left wheel and we found ourselves in a sort of enclosed courtyard. The dawn was breaking and the rain had ceased. In front of us were four stacks of rifles, three to a stack. The officer brought us to attention and gave the order to unpile arms. We each took a rifle. Giving us stand at ease, in a nervous and shaky voice, he informed, Men, you are here on a very solemn duty. 
you have been selected as a firing squad for the execution of a soldier who having been found guilty of a grievous crime against king and country has been regularly and duly tried and sentenced to be shot at three twenty eight a m this date this sentence has been approved by the reviewing authority and ordered carried out it is our duty to carry on with the sentence of the court there are twelve rifles one of which contains a blank cartridge the other eleven containing ball cartridges every man is expected to do his duty and fire to kill take your orders from me squad shut we came to attention then he left my heart was of lead and my knees shook after standing at attention for what seemed a week though in reality it could not have been over five minutes we heard a low whispering in our rear and footsteps on the stone flagging of the courtyard our officer reappeared and in a low but firm voice ordered about turn we turned about in the gray light of dawn a few yards in front of me i could make out a brick wall against this wall was a dark form with a white square pinned on its breast we were supposed to aim at this square to the right of the form i noticed a white spot on the wall this would be my target ready aim fire the dark form sank into a huddled heap my bullet sped on its way and hit the whitish spot on the wall i could see the splinters fly someone else had received the rifle containing the blank cartridge but my mind was at ease there was no blood of a tommy on my hands Porter arms about turn pile arms stand clear the stacks were reformed quick march right wheel and we left the scene of execution behind us it was now daylight after marching about five minutes we were dismissed with the following instructions from the officer in command return alone to your respective companies and remember no talking about this affair or else it will go hard with the guilty ones we needed no urging to get away i did not recognize any of the men on the firing squad even the officer was a stranger to me the victim's relations and friends in Blighty will never know that he was executed. They will be under the impression that he died doing his bit for king and country. In the public casualty lists, his name will appear under the caption, Accidentally Killed, or Died. The day after the execution I received orders to report back to the line, and to keep a still tongue in my head. Executions are a part of the day's work but the part we hated most of all, I think certainly the saddest. The British War Department is thought by many people to be composed of rigid regulations all wound around with red tape. But it has a heart, and one of the evidences of this is the considerate way in which an execution is concealed and reported to the relative of the unfortunate man. They never know the truth. He is listed in the bulletins as among the accidentally killed. In the last ten years I have several times read stories in magazines of cowards changing in a charge to heroes. I used to laugh at it. It seemed easy for story writers, but I said, men aren't made that way. But over in France I learned once that the streak of yellow can turn all white. I picked up the story, bit by bit, from the captain of the company, the sentries who guarded the poor fellow, as well as from my own observations. At first I did not realize the whole of his story, but after a week of investigation it stood out as clear in my mind as the mountains of my native west in the spring sunshine. It impressed me so much that I wrote it all down in rest billets on odd scraps of paper. The incidents are, as I say, every bit true. The feelings of the man are true. I know from all I underwent in the fighting over in France. We will call him Albert Lloyd. That wasn't his name, but it will do. Albert Lloyd was what the world terms a coward. In London, they called him a slacker. His country had been at war nearly eighteen months, and still he was not in khaki. He had no good reason for not enlisting, being alone in the world, having been educated in an orphan asylum, and there being no one dependent upon him for support. He had no good position to lose, and there was no sweetheart to tell him, with her lips to go, while her eyes pleaded for him to stay. 
Every time he saw a recruiting sergeant, he'd slink around the corner out of sight, with a terrible fear gnawing at his heart. When passing the big recruiting posters, and on his way to business and back he passed many, he would pull down his cap and look the other way, to get away from that awful finger pointing at him, under the caption, Your king and country need you, or the boring eyes of Kitchener, which burned into his very soul, causing him to shudder. Then the Zeppelin raids. During them he used to crouch in a corner of his boarding-house cellar, whimpering like a whipped puppy, and calling upon the Lord to protect him. Even his landlady despised him, although she had to admit that he was good pay. He very seldom read the papers, but one momentous morning, the landlady put the morning paper at his place before he came down to breakfast. Taking his seat, he read the flaring headline, Conscription Bill Passed, and nearly fainted. Excusing himself, he stumbled upstairs to his bedroom, with the horror of it gnawing into his vitals. Having saved up a few pounds, he decided not to leave the house, and to sham sickness, so he stayed in his room and had the landlady serve his meals there. Every time there was a knock at the door, he trembled all over, imagining it was a policeman who had come to take him away to the army. One morning, his fears were realized. Sure enough, there stood a policeman with a fatal paper. Taking it in his trembling hand, he read that he, Albert Lloyd, was ordered to report himself to the nearest recruiting station for physical examination. He reported immediately, because he was afraid to disobey. The doctor looked with approval upon Lloyd's six feet of physical perfection, and thought what a fine guardsman he would make, but examined his heart twice before he passed him as physically fit. It was beating so fast. From the recruiting depot Lloyd was taken, with many others, in charge of a sergeant, to the training depot at Aldershot, where he was given an outfit of khaki, and drew his other equipment. He made a fine-looking soldier, except for the slight shrinking in his shoulders, and the hunted look in his eyes. At the training depot it does not take long to find out a man's character, and Lloyd was promptly dubbed Windy. In the English army, Windy means cowardly. The smallest recruit in the barracks looked on him with contempt, and was not slow to show it in many ways. Lloyd was a good soldier, learned quickly, obeyed every order promptly, never groused at the hardest fatigues. He was afraid to. He lived in deadly fear of the officers and non-coms over him. They also despised him. One morning, about three months after his enlistment, Lloyd's company was paraded, and the names picked for the next draft to France were read. When his name was called, he did not step out smartly, two paces to the front, and answer cheerfully, "'Here, sir!' as the others did. He just fainted in ranks, and was carried to barracks amid the sneers of the rest." That night was an agony of misery to him. He could not sleep, just cried and whimpered in his bunk, because on the morrow the draft was to sail for France, where he would see death on all sides, and perhaps be killed himself. On the steamer, crossing the channel, he would have jumped overboard to escape, but was afraid of drowning. Arriving in France, he and the rest were huddled into cattle cars. On the side of each appeared in white letters, Chevaux eight. Um, forty. After hours of bumping over the uneven French roadbeds, they arrived at the training base of Rouen. At this place they were put through a week's rigid training in trench warfare. On the morning of the eighth day they paraded at ten o'clock, and were inspected and passed by General H., then were marched to the quartermasters to draw their gas helmets and trench equipment. At four in the afternoon they were again hustled into cattle cars. This time the journey lasted two days. They disembarked at the town of Prevent, and could hear a distant dull booming. With knees shaking, Lloyd asked the sergeant what the noise was, and nearly dropped when the sergeant replied in a somewhat bored tone, "'Oh, them's the guns up the line. We'll be up there in a couple of days or so. Don't worry, me laddie. You'll see more of them than you want before you get home to Blighty again.' That is, if you're lucky enough to get back. Now lend a hand there, unloading them cars, and quit that everlasting shaking. I believe you're scared. The last with a contemptuous sneer. 
They marched ten kilometers, full pack, to a little dilapidated village, and the sound of the guns grew louder, constantly louder. The village was full of soldiers who turned out to inspect the new draft, the men who were shortly to be their mates in the trenches, for they were going up the line on the morrow to take over their certain sector of trenches. The draft was paraded in front of battalion headquarters, and the men were assigned to companies. Lloyd was the only man assigned to D Company. Perhaps the officer in charge of the draft had something to do with it, for he called Lloyd aside and said, "'Lloyd, you are going to a new company. No one knows you. Your bed will be as you make it, so for God's sake, brace up and be a man. I think you have the stuff in you, my boy. So good-bye, and the best of luck to you.' The next day the battalion took over their part of the trenches. It happened to be a very quiet day. The artillery behind the lines was still, except for an occasional shell sent over to let the Germans know the gunners were not asleep. In the darkness, in single file, the company slowly wended their way down the communication trench to the front line. No one noticed Lloyd's white and drawn face. After they had relieved the company in the trenches, Lloyd, with two of the old company men, was put on guard in one of the traverses. Not a shot was fired from the German lines, and no one paid any attention to him crouched on the firing step. On the first time in, a new recruit is not required to stand with his head over the top. He only sits it out, while the older men keep watch. At about ten o'clock, all of a sudden, he thought hell had broken loose, and crouched and shivered up against the parapet. Shells started bursting, as he imagined, right in their trench, when in fact they were landing about a hundred yards in rear of them in the second lines. One of the older men on guard, turning to his mate, said, "'There goes Fritz with those damn trench mortars again. It's about time our artillery taped them and set over a few. Well, I'll be damned. Where's that blighter of a draft-man gone to? There's his rifle leaning against the parapet. He must have legged it. Just keep your eye peeled, Dick, while I report it to the sergeant. I wonder if the fool knows he can be shot for such tricks as leaving his post. Lloyd had gone. When the trench mortars opened up, a maddening terror seized him, and he wanted to run, to get away from that horrible din, anywhere to safety. So quietly sneaking around the traverse, he came to the entrance of a communication trench, and ran madly and blindly down it running into traverses, stumbling into muddy holes, and falling full length over trench grids. Groping blindly, with his arms stretched out in front of him, he at last came out of the trench into the village, or what used to be a village before the German artillery raised it. Mixed with his fear, he had a peculiar sort of cunning, which whispered to him to avoid all sentries, because if they saw him he would be sent back to that awful destruction in the front line, and perhaps be killed or maimed. The thought made him shudder, the cold sweat coming out in beads on his face. On his left, in the darkness, he could make out the shadowy forms of trees, crawling on his hands and knees, stopping and crouching with fear at each shell-burst, he finally reached an old orchard, and cowered at the base of a shot-scarred apple-tree. He remained there all night, listening to the sound of the guns, and ever praying, praying that his useless life would be spared. As dawn began to break, he could discern little dark objects protruding from the ground all about him. Curiosity mastered his fear, and he crawled to one of the objects, and there, in the uncertain light, he read on a little wooden cross, Private H. S. Wheaton, No. 1670, 1st London Regiment, R. F., Killed in Action, April 25, 1916, R. I. P. Rest in Peace. When it dawned on him that he had been hiding all night in a cemetery, his reason seemed to leave him, and a mad desire to be free from it all made him rush madly away, falling over little wooden crosses, smashing some and trampling others under his feet. In his flight he came to an old French dugout, half caved in, and partially filled with slimy and filthy water. Like a fox being chased by the hounds, he ducked into this hole, and threw himself on a pile of old empty sandbags wet and mildewed, then unconsciousness. On the next day he came to, far distant voices sounded in his ears. 
Opening his eyes, in the entrance of the dugout he saw a corporal and two men with fixed bayonets. The corporal was addressing him. "'Get up, you white-livered blighter! Curse you in the day you ever joined D Company, spoiling their fine record. It'll be you up against the wall, and a good job, too. Get a hold of him, men, and if he makes a break, give him the bayonet, and send it home, the cowardly sneak. Come on, you, move. We've been looking for you long enough.' Lloyd, trembling and weakened by his long fast, tottered out, assisted by a soldier on each side of him. They took him before the captain, but could get nothing out of him but, "'For God's sake, sir, don't have me shot! Don't have me shot!' The captain, utterly disgusted with him, sent him under escort to division headquarters for trial by court-martial, charged with desertion under fire. They shoot deserters in France." During his trial, Lloyd sat as one dazed, and could put nothing forward in his defence, only an occasional, "'Don't have me shot!' His sentence was passed. To be shot at 3.38 o'clock in the morning of May 18, 1916. This meant that he had only one more day to live. He did not realise the awfulness of his sentence. His brain seemed paralysed. He knew nothing of his trip under guard in a motor lorry to the sandbagged guard room in the village, where he was dumped on the floor and left, while a sentry with a fixed bayonet paced up and down in front of the entrance. Bully beef, water, and biscuits were left beside him for his supper. The sentry, seeing that he ate nothing, came inside and shook him by the shoulder, saying in a kind voice, "'Cheero, laddie, better eat something. You'll feel better. Don't give up hope.' You'll be pardoned before morning. I know the way they run these things. They're only trying to scare you, that's all. Come now, there's a good lad. Eat something. It'll make the world look different to you. The good-hearted sentry knew he was lying about the pardon. He knew nothing short of a miracle could save the poor lad. Lloyd listened eagerly to his sentry's words and believed them. A look of hope came into his eyes, and he ravenously ate the meal beside him. In about an hour's time the chaplain came to see him, but Lloyd would have none of him. He wanted no parson. He was to be pardoned. The artillery behind the lines suddenly opened up with everything they had. An intense bombardment of the enemy's lines had commenced. The roar of the guns was deafening. Lloyd's fears came back with a rush, and he cowered on the earthen floor with his hands over his face. The sentry, seeing his position, came in and tried to cheer him by talking to him. "'Never mind them guts, boy. They won't hurt you. They are ours. We are giving the Boche a dose of their own medicine. Our boys are going over the top at dawn of the morning to take their trenches. We'll give them a taste of cold steel with their sausages and beer. You just sit tight now, until they relieve you. I'll have to go now, lad, as it's nearly time for my relief.' and I don't want them to see me a-talking with you. So long, laddie. Cheerio. With this the sentry resumed the pacing of his post. In about ten minutes' time he was relieved, and a D-company man took his place. Looking into the guardhouse, the sentry noticed the cowering attitude of Lloyd, and with a sneer said to him, "'Instead of whimpering in that corner, you ought to be saying your prayers. It's bally conscripts like you what's spoiling our record.' We've been out here nigh unto eighteen months, and you're the first man to desert his post. The whole battalion is laughing and poking fun at D Company. Bad luck to you, but you won't get another chance to disgrace us. They'll put your lights out in the morning. After listening to this tirade, Lloyd, in a faltering voice, asked, They're not going to shoot me, are they? Why, the other sentry said they'd pardon me. "'For God's sake, don't tell me I'm to be shot!' And his voice died away in a sob. "'Of course they're going to shoot you. The other sentry was just a-kiddin' you. Just like old Smith. Always a-trying to cheer someone. You ain't got no more chance of being pardoned than I have of getting to be colonel of my bat.' When the fact that all hope was gone finally entered Lloyd's brain, a calm seemed to settle over him, and rising to his knees, with his arms stretched out to heaven, he prayed, and all of his soul entered into the prayer. O oh, good and merciful God! 
Give me strength to die like a man. Deliver me from this coward's death. Give me a chance to die like my mates in the fighting line, to die fighting for my country. I ask this of thee. A peace, hitherto unknown, came to him, and he crouched and cowered no more, but calmly waited the dawn, ready to go to his death. The shells were bursting all around the guard-room, but he hardly noticed them. While waiting there, the voice of the sentry, singing in a low tone, came to him. He was singing the chorus of the popular trench ditty, I want to go home, I want to go home, I don't want to go to the trenches no more, where the whiz-bangs and sausages roar galore. Take me o'er the sea, where the Alaman can't get at me. Oh, my, I don't want to die. I want to go home. Lloyd listened to the words with a strange interest, and wondered what kind of a home he would go to across the Great Divide. It would be the only home he had ever known. Suddenly there came a great rushing through the air, a blinding flash, a deafening report, and the sandbag walls of the guardroom toppled over, and then blackness. When Lloyd recovered consciousness, he was lying on his right side, facing what used to be the entrance of the guardroom. Now it was only a jumble of rent and torn sandbags. His head seemed bursting. He slowly rose on his elbow, and there in the east the dawn was breaking. But what was that mangled shape lying over there among the sandbags? Slowly dragging himself to it, he saw the body of the sentry. One look was enough to know that he was dead. The soldier's head was missing. The sentry had had his wish gratified. He had gone home. He was safe at last from the whiz-bangs and the alaman. Like a flash it came to Lloyd that he was free, free to go over the top with his company, free to die like a true Briton, fighting for his king and country. A great gladness and warmth came over him. Carefully stepping over the body of the sentry, he started on a mad race down the ruined street of the village, amid the bursting shells, minding them not, dodging through or around hurrying platoons on their way to also go over the top. Coming to a communication trench he could not get through. It was blocked with laughing, cheering, and cursing soldiers. Climbing out of the trench, he ran wildly along the top, never heeding the rain of machine-gun bullets and shells, not even hearing the shouts of the officers, telling him to get back into the trench. He was going to join his company, who were in the front line. He was going to fight with them. He, the despised coward, had come into his own. While he was racing along, jumping over trenches crowded with soldiers, a ringing cheer broke out all along the front line, and his heart sank. He knew he was too late. His company had gone over, but still he ran madly, he would catch them. He would die with them. Meanwhile, his company had gone over. They, with the other companies, had taken the first and second German trenches, and had pushed steadily on to the third line. D Company, led by their captain, the one who had sent Lloyd to division headquarters for trial, charged with desertion, had pushed steadily forward until they found themselves far in advance of the rest of the attacking force. Bombing out, trench after trench, and using their bayonets, they came to a German communication trench, which ended in a blind sap, and then the captain, and what was left of his men, knew they were in a trap. They would not retire. D Company never retired, and they were D Company. Right in front of them they could see hundreds of Germans preparing to rush them with bomb and bayonet. They would have some chance if ammunition and bombs could reach them from the rear. Their supply was exhausted and the men realized it would be a case of dying as bravely as possible, or making a run for it. But D Company would not run. It was against their traditions and principles. The Germans would have to advance across an open space of three to four hundred yards before they could get within bombing distance of the trench, and then it would be all their own way. Turning to his company, the captain said, "'Men, it's a case of going west for us. We are out of ammunition and bombs.' and the Bosch have us in a trap. They will bomb us out. Our bayonets are useless here. We will have to go over and meet them, and it's a case of thirty to one. So send every thrust home, and die like the men of D Company should. When I give the word, follow me, and up and at them. Give them hell. God, if we only had a machine-gun, we could wipe them out. Here they come. 
Get ready, men. Just as he finished speaking, the welcome pup-pup of a machine gun in their rear rang out, and the front line of the onrushing Germans seemed to melt away. They wavered, but once again came rushing onward. Down went their second line. The machine gun was taking an awful toll of lives. Then again they tried to advance, but the machine gun mowed them down. Dropping their rifles and bombs, they broke and fled in a wild rush back to their trench, amid the cheers of D Company. They were forming again for another attempt, when in the rear of D Company came a mighty cheer. The ammunition had arrived, and with it a battalion of Scotch to reinforce them. They were saved. The unknown machine gunner had come to the rescue in the nick of time. With the reinforcements, it was an easy task to take the third German line. After the attack was over, the captain and three of his non-commissioned officers wended their way back to the position where the machine gun had done its deadly work. He wanted to thank the gunner in the name of D Company for his magnificent deed. They arrived at the gun, and an awful sight met their eyes. Lloyd had reached the front-line trench after his company had left it. A strange company was nimbly crawling up the trench ladders. They were reinforcements going over. They were Scotties, and they made a magnificent sight in their brightly colored kilts and bare knees. Jumping over the trench, Lloyd raced across no man's land, unheeding the rain of bullets, leaping over dark forms on the ground, some of which lay still, while others called out to him as he speeded past. He came to the German front line, but it was deserted, except for heaps of dead and wounded, a grim tribute to the work of his company, good old D Company. Leaping trenches and gasping for breath, Lloyd could see right ahead of him his company in a dead-ended sap of a communication trench, and across the open, away in front of them, a mass of Germans preparing for a charge. Why didn't D Company fire on them? Why were they so strangely silent? What were they waiting for? Then he knew. Their ammunition was exhausted. But what was that on his right? A machine gun. Why didn't it open fire and save them? He would make that gun's crew do their duty. Rushing over to the gun, he saw why it had not opened fire. Scattered around its base lay six still forms. They had brought their gun to consolidate the captured position, but a German machine gun had decreed they would never fire again. Lloyd rushed to the gun, and grasping the traversing handles, trained it on the Germans. He pressed the thumb piece, but only a sharp click was the result. The gun was unloaded. Then he realized his helplessness. He did not know how to load the gun. Oh, why hadn't he attended the machine-gun course in England? He'd been offered the chance, but with a blush of shame he remembered that he had been afraid. The nickname of the machine-gunners had frightened him. They were called the Suicide Club. Now, because of this fear, his company would be destroyed. The men of D Company would have to die, because he, Albert Lloyd, had been afraid of a name. In his shame he cried like a baby. Anyway, he could die with them, and rising to his feet, he stumbled over the body of one of the gunners, who emitted a faint moan. A gleam of hope flashed through him. Perhaps this man could tell him how to load the gun. Stooping over the body, he gently shook it, and the soldier opened his eyes. Seeing Lloyd, he closed them again, and in a faint voice said, "'Get away, you blighter! Leave me alone! I don't want any coward around me!' The words cut Lloyd like a knife, but he was desperate. Taking the revolver out of the holster of the dying man, he pressed the cold muzzle to the soldier's head, and replied, "'Yes, it is Lloyd, the coward of Company D. But so help me God, if you don't tell me how to load that gun, I'll put a bullet through your brain.' A sunny smile came over the countenance of the dying man, and he said in a faint whisper, "'Good old boy! I knew!' You wouldn't disgrace our company. Lloyd interposed. For God's sake, if you want to save that company you are so proud of, tell me how to load that damned gun. As if reciting a lesson in school, the soldier replied in a weak, sing-song voice, Insert tag end of belt in feed block. With left hand, pull belt, left front. Pull crank handle back on roller. Let go. And repeat motion. Gun is now loaded. To fire, raise automatic safety latch, and press thumb piece. Gun is now firing. If gun stops, 
ascertain position of crank handle. But Lloyd waited for no more. With wild joy at his heart he took a belt from one of the ammunition boxes lying beside the gun, and followed the dying man's instructions. Then he pressed the thumb piece, and a burst of fire rewarded his efforts. The gun was working. Training it on the Germans, he shouted for joy as their front rank went down. Traversing the gun back and forth along the mass of Germans, he saw them break and run back to the cover of their trench, leaving their dead and wounded behind. He had saved his company. He, Lloyd, the coward, had done his bit. Releasing the thumbpiece, he looked at the watch on his wrist. He was still alive, and the hands pointed to 338, the time set for his death by the court. Ping! A bullet sang through the air, and Lloyd fell forward across the gun. A thin trickle of blood ran down his face from a little, black, round hole in his forehead. The sentence of the court had been duly carried out. The captain slowly raised the limp form drooping over the gun, and, wiping the blood from the white face, recognized it as Lloyd, the coward of D Company. Reverently covering the face with his handkerchief, he turned to his non-coms, and in a voice husky with emotion, addressed them. "'Boys, it's Lloyd the deserter. He has redeemed himself, died the death of a hero, died that his mates might live.' That afternoon a solemn procession wended its way toward the cemetery. In the front a stretcher was carried by two sergeants. Across the stretcher the Union Jack was carefully spread. Behind the stretcher came a captain and forty-three men, all that were left of D Company. Arriving at the cemetery, they halted in front of an open grave. All about them, wooden crosses were broken and trampled into the ground. A grizzled old sergeant, noting this destruction, muttered under his breath, "'Curse the cowardly blighter who wrecked these crosses! If I could only get these two hands around his neck, his trip west would be a short one.' The corpse on the stretcher seemed to move, or it might have been the wind blowing the folds of the Union Jack. End of chapter Chapters 25 and 26 of Over the Top this LibriVox recording is in the public domain, and is recorded by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Over the Top by Arthur Empey Chapter 25 Preparing for the Big Push Dejoining Atwell after the execution, I had a hard time trying to keep my secret from him. I think I must have lost at least ten pounds worrying over the affair. Beginning at seven in the evening, it was our duty to patrol all communication and front-line trenches, making note of unusual occurrences, and arresting anyone who should, to us, appear to be acting in a suspicious manner. We slept during the day. Behind the lines there was great activity, supplies and ammunition pouring in, and long columns of troops constantly passing. We were preparing for the big offensive, the forerunner of the Battle of the Somme, or Big Push. The never-ending stream of men, supplies, ammunition, and guns pouring into the British lines made a mighty spectacle, one that cannot be described. It has to be witnessed with your own eyes to appreciate its vastness. At our part of the line the influx of supplies never ended. It looked like a huge snake slowly crawling forward, never a hitch or break, a wonderful tribute to the system and efficiency of Great Britain's contemptible little army of five millions of men. Huge fifteen-inch guns snaked along, foot by foot, by powerful steam tractors. Then a long line of 4.5 batteries, each gun drawn by six horses. Then a couple of 9.2 howitzers pulled by immense caterpillar engines. When one of these caterpillars would pass me with its mighty monster in tow, a flush of pride would mount to my face, because I could plainly read on the nameplate, Made in USA and I would remember that if I wore a nameplate it would also read, Made in USA. Then I would stop to think how thin and straggly that mighty stream would be if all the Made in USA parts of it were withdrawn. Then would come hundreds of limbers and GS wagons drawn by sleek, well-fed mules, 
ridden by sleek, well-fed men, ever smiling. Although grimy with sweat and covered with the fine white dust of the marvelously well-made French roads. What a discouraging report the German airmen must have taken back to their division commanders, and this stream is slowly but surely getting bigger and bigger every day, and the pace is always the same, no slower, no faster, but ever onward, ever forward. Three weeks before the big push of July 1st, as the Battle of the Somme has been called, started, exact duplicates of the German trenches were dug about thirty kilometers behind our lines. The layout of the trenches were taken from airplane photographs submitted by the Royal Flying Corps. The trenches were correct to the foot. They showed dugouts, saps, barbed wire defenses, and danger spots. Battalions that were to go over in the first waves were sent back for three days to study these trenches, engage in practice attacks, and have night maneuvers. Each man was required to make a map of the trenches and familiarize himself with the names and location of the parts his battalion was to attack. In the American Army, non-commissioned officers are put through a course of map-making or road sketching, and during my six years' service in the United States Cavalry, I had plenty of practice in this work. Therefore, mapping these trenches was a comparatively easy task for me. Each man had to submit his map to the company commander to be passed upon, and I was lucky enough to have mine selected as being sufficiently authentic to use in the attack. No photographs or maps are allowed to leave France, but in this case it appealed to me as a valuable souvenir of the Great War, and I managed to smuggle it through. At this time it carries no military importance, as the British lines, I am happy to say, have since been advanced beyond this point, so it has been reproduced in this book without breaking any regulation or cautions of the British Army. The whole attack was rehearsed and rehearsed until we heartily cursed the one who had conceived the idea. The trenches were named according to a system which made it very simple for Tommy to find, even in the dark, any point in the German lines. These imitation trenches, or trench models, were well guarded from observation by numerous allied planes which constantly circled above them. No German airplane could approach within observing distance. A restricted area was maintained, and no civilian was allowed within three miles, so we felt sure that we had a great surprise in store for Fritz. When we took over the front line we received an awful shock. The Germans displayed signboards over the top of their trench, showing the names that we had called their trenches. The signs read, Fair, Fact, Fate, and Fancy, and so on, according to the code names on our map. Then, to rub it in, they hoisted some more signs, which read, When are you coming over? Or, Come on, we are ready, stupid English. It is still a mystery to me how they obtained this knowledge. There had been no raids or prisoners taken, so it must have been the work of spies in our own lines. Three or four days before the big push we tried to shatter Fritz's nerves by faint attacks, and partially succeeded, as the official reports of July 1st show. Although we were constantly bombarding their lines day and night, still we fooled the Germans several times. This was accomplished by throwing an intense barrage into his lines. Then, using smoke shells, we would put a curtain of white smoke across no man's land, completely obstructing his view of our trenches, and would raise our curtain of fire as if in an actual attack. All down our trenches the men would shout and cheer, and Fritz would turn loose with machine-gun, rifle, and shrapnel fire, thinking we were coming over. After three or four of these dummy attacks, his nerves must have been near the breaking point. On June 24, 1916, at 9.40 in the morning, our guns opened up, and hell was let loose. The din was terrific, a constant boom, 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 in your ear. At night the sky was a red glare. Our bombardment had lasted about two hours when Fritz started replying. Although we were sending over ten shells to his one, our casualties were heavy. There was a constant stream of stretchers coming out of the communication trenches, and burial parties were a common sight. In the dugouts the noise of the guns almost hurt. You had the same sensation as when riding on the subway you entered the tube under the river going to Brooklyn, a sort of pressure on the eardrums, and the ground constantly trembling. 
The roads behind the trenches were very dangerous, because Bosch shrapnel was constantly bursting over them. We avoided these dangerous spots by crossing through open fields. The destruction in the German lines was awful, and I really felt sorry for them, because I realized how they must be clicking it. From our front-line trench, every now and again, we could hear sharp whistle-blasts in the German trenches. These blasts were the signals for stretcher-bearers, and meant the wounding or killing of some German in the service of his fatherland. Atwell and I had a tough time of it, patrolling the different trenches at night, but after a while got used to it. My old outfit, the Machine Gun Company, was stationed in huge elephant dugouts about four hundred yards behind the front-line trench. They were in reserve. Occasionally I would stop in their dugout and have a confab with my former mates. Although we tried to be jolly, still, there was a lurking feeling of impending disaster. Each man was wondering if, after the slogan, Over the top with the best of luck, had been sounded, would he still be alive, or would he be lying somewhere in France? In an old dilapidated house, the walls of which were scarred with machine-gun bullets, Number 3 section of the machine-gun company had its quarters. The company's cooks prepared the meals in this billet. On the fifth evening of the bombardment, a German eight-inch shell registered a direct hit on the billet and wiped out ten men who were asleep in the supposedly bomb-proof cellar. They were buried the next day, and I attended the funeral. Chapter 26 All Quiet on the Western Front at Brigade Headquarters, I happened to overhear a conversation between our G.O.C., General Officer Commanding, and the Divisional Commander. From this conversation I learned that we were to bombard the German lines for eight days, and on the 1st of July the big push was to commence. In a few days orders were issued to that effect, and it was common property all along the line. On the afternoon of the eighth day of our strafing, Atwell and I were sitting in the front-line trench, smoking fags, and making out our reports of the previous night's tour of the trenches, which we had to turn into headquarters the following day, when an order was passed down the trench that Old Pepper requested twenty volunteers to go over on a trench raid that night, to try and get a few German prisoners for information purposes. I immediately volunteered for this job, and shook hands with Atwell, and went to the rear to give my name to the officers in charge of the raiding party. I was accepted, worse luck. At 9.40 that night we reported to the brigade headquarters dugout to receive instructions from Old Pepper. After reaching this dugout we lined up in a semicircle around him, and he addressed us as follows. All I want you boys to do is to go over to the German lines tonight, surprise them, secure a couple of prisoners, and return immediately. Our artillery has bombarded that section of the line for two days, and personally I believe that that part of the German trench is unoccupied. So just get a couple of prisoners and return as quickly as possible. The sergeant on my right, in an undertone, whispered to me, Say, Yank, how are we going to get a couple of prisoners if the old fool thinks, personally, that that part of the trench is unoccupied? Sounds kind of fishy, don't it, mate? I had a funny sinking sensation in my stomach, and my tin hat felt as if it weighed about a ton, and my enthusiasm was melting away. Old Pepper must have heard the sergeant speak, because he turned in his direction and in a thundering voice asked, "'What did you say?' The sergeant, with a scared look on his face and his knees trembling, smartly saluted and answered, "'Nothing, sir.' Old Pepper said, "'Well, don't say it so loudly the next time.' Then Old Pepper continued. In this section of the German trenches there are two or three machine guns which our artillery, in the last two or three days, has been unable to tape. These guns command the sector where two of our communication trenches join the front line, and as the brigade is to go over the top tomorrow morning, I want to capture two or three men from these guns' crews and from them I may be able to obtain valuable information as to the exact location of the guns, and our artillery will therefore be able to demolish them before the attack, and thus prevent our losing a lot of men, while using these communication trenches to bring up reinforcements. These were the instructions he gave us. Take off your identification discs, 
Strip your uniforms of all numerals, insignia, etc. Leave your papers with your captains, because I don't want the Boche to know what regiments are against them, as this would be valuable information to them in our attack tomorrow, and I don't want any of you to be taken alive. What I want is two prisoners, and if I get them I have a way which will make them divulge all necessary information as to their guns. You have your choice of two weapons. You may carry your persuaders or your knuckle-knives, and each man will arm himself with four mills bombs, these to be used only in case of emergency. A persuader is Tommy's nickname for a club carried by the bombers. It is about two feet long, thin at one end and very thick at the other. The thick end is studded with sharp steel spikes, while through the center of the club there is a nine-inch lead bar to give it weight and balance. When you get a prisoner, all you have to do is just stick this club up in front of him, and believe me, the prisoner's patriotism for Deutschland über alles fades away, and he very willingly obeys the orders of his captor. If, however, the prisoner gets high-toned and refuses to follow you, simply persuade him, by first removing his tin hat, and then, well, the use of the lead weight in the persuader is demonstrated, and Tommy looks for another prisoner. The knuckle-knife is a dagger affair, the blade of which is about eight inches long with a heavy steel guard over the grip. This guard is studded with steel projections. At night in a trench, which is only about three to four feet wide, it makes a very handy weapon. One punch in the face generally shatters a man's jaw, and you can get him with the knife as he goes down. Then we had what we called our come-alongs. These are strands of barbed wire about three feet long, made into a noose at one end. At the other end the barbs are cut off, and Tommy slips his wrist through the loop to get a good grip on the wire. If the prisoner wants to argue the point, why, just place the large loop around his neck, and no matter if Tommy wishes to return to his trenches at the walk, trot, or gallop, Fritz is perfectly agreeable to maintain Tommy's rate of speed. We were ordered to black our faces and hands, for this reason. At night, the English and Germans use what they call star shells, a sort of rocket affair. These are fired from a large pistol about twenty inches long, which is held over the sandbag parapet of the trench and discharged into the air. These star shells attain a height of about sixty feet, and a range of from fifty to seventy-five yards. When they hit the ground they explode, throwing out a strong calcium light which lights up the ground in a circle of a radius of between ten to fifteen yards. They also have a parachute star shell, which, after reaching a height of about sixty feet, explodes. A parachute unfolds and slowly floats to the ground, lighting up a large circle in no man's land. The official name of the star shell is a very light. Very lights are used to prevent night surprise attacks on the trenches. If a star shell falls in front of you, or between you and the German lines, you are safe from detection, as the enemy cannot see you through the bright curtain of light. But if it falls behind you, and, as Tommy says, you get into the star shell zone, then the fun begins. You have to lie flat on your stomach and remain absolutely motionless until the light of the shell dies out. This takes anywhere from forty to seventy seconds. If you haven't time to fall to the ground, you must remain absolutely still in whatever position you were in when the light exploded. It is advisable not to breathe, as Fritz has an eye like an eagle when he thinks you are knocking at his door. When a star shell is burning in Tommy's rear, he can hold his breath for a week. You blacken your face and hands, so that the light from the star shells will not reflect on your pale face. In a trench raid there is quite sufficient reason for your face to be pale. If you don't believe me, try it just once. Then another reason for blacking your face and hands is that, after you have entered the German trench at night, white face means Germans, black face, English. Coming around a traverse you see a white face in front of you. With a prayer and Wishing Fritz the best of luck, you introduce him to your persuader, or knuckle-knife. A little later, we arrived at the communication trench named Whiskey Street, which led to the fire trench at the point we were to go over at the top and out in front. In our rear were four stretcher-bearers and a corporal of the REMC, carrying a pouch containing medicines and first-aid appliances. 
kind of a grim reminder to us that our expedition was not going to be exactly a picnic. The order of things was reversed. In civilian life, the doctors generally come first, with the undertakers tagging in the rear, and then the insurance man. But in our case, the undertakers were leading, with the doctors trailing behind, minus the insurance adjuster. The presence of the REMC men did not seem to disturb the raiders, because many a joke, made in an undertone, was passed along the winding column, as to who would be first to take a ride on one of the stretchers. This was generally followed by a wish that, if you were to be the one, the wound would be a cushy, blighty one. The stretcher-bearers, no doubt, were hoping that, if they did have to carry any one to the rear, he would be small and light. Perhaps they looked at me when wishing, because I could feel an uncomfortable, boring sensation between my shoulder-blades. They got their wish all right. Going up this trench, about every sixty yards or so, we would pass a lonely sentry, who in a whisper would wish us, "'The bust of luck, mites!' We would blind at him under our breaths. That Jonah phrase to us sounded very ominous. Without any casualties, the minstrel troop arrived in Suicide Ditch, the front-line trench. Previously, a wiring party of the Royal Engineers had cut a lane through our barbed wire to enable us to get out into no-man's land. Crawling through this lane, our party of twenty took up an extended order formation about one yard apart. We had a tap code arranged for our movements while in no man's land, because for various reasons it is not safe to carry on a heated conversation a few yards in front of Fritz's lines. The officer was on the right of the line, while I was on the extreme left. Two taps from the right would be passed down the line until I received them, then I would send back one tap. The officer, in receiving this one tap, would know that his order had gone down the whole line, had been understood and that the party was ready to obey the two-tap signal. Two taps meant that we were to crawl forward slowly, and believe me, very slowly, for five yards, and then halt to await further instructions. Three taps meant, when you arrived within striking distance of the German trench, rush it and inflict as many casualties as possible, secure a couple of prisoners, and then back to your own lines with the speed clutch open. Four taps meant, I have gotten you into a position from which it is impossible for me to extricate you, so you are on your own. After getting Tommy into a mess on the western front, he is generally told that he is on his own. This means, save your skin in any way possible. Tommy loves to be on his own behind the lines, but not during a trench raid. The star shells from the German lines were falling in front of us, therefore we were safe. After about twenty minutes we entered the star shell zone. A star shell from the German lines fell about five yards in the rear and to the right of me. We hugged the ground and held our breath until it burned out. The smoke from the star shell traveled along the ground and crossed over the middle of our line. Some Tommy sneezed. The smoke had gotten up his nose. We crouched on the ground, cursing the offender under our breath, and waited the volley that gently ensues when the Germans have heard a noise in no man's land. Nothing happened. We received two taps and crawled forward slowly for five yards. No doubt the officer believed what Old Pepper had said. Personally, I believe that that part of the German trench is unoccupied. By being careful and remaining motionless when the star shells fell behind us, we reached the German barbed wire without mishap. Then the fun began. I was scared stiff, as it is ticklish work cutting your way through wire when about thirty feet in front of you there is a line of Boches looking out into no man's land with their rifles laying across the parapet, straining every sense to see or hear what is going on in no man's land, because at night Fritz never knows when a bomb with his name and number on it will come hurtling through the air, aimed in the direction of Berlin. The man on the right, one man in the center, and myself on the extreme left, were equipped with wire cutters. These are insulated with soft rubber, not because the German wires are charged with electricity, but to prevent the cutters rubbing against the barbed wire stakes, which are of iron, and making a noise which may warn the inmates of the trench that someone is getting fresh in their front yard. There is only one way to cut a barbed wire without noise, and through costly experience, Tommy has become an expert in doing this. 
you must grasp the wire about two inches from the stake in your right hand and cut between the stake and your hand. If you cut a wire improperly, a loud twang will ring out on the night air like the snapping of a banjo string. Perhaps this noise can be heard for only fifty or seventy-five yards, but in Tommy's mind it makes a loud noise in Berlin. We had cut a lane about halfway through the wire when, down the center of our line, twang, went an improperly cut wire. We crouched down, cursing under our breath, trembling all over, our knees lacerated from the strands of the cut barbed wire on the ground, waiting for a challenge and the inevitable volley of rifle fire. Nothing happened. I suppose the fellow who cut the barbed wire improperly was the one who had sneezed about half an hour previously. What we wished him would never make his new year a happy one. The officer, in my opinion, at the noise of the wire, should have given the four tap signal, which meant, on your own, get back to your trenches as quickly as possible. But again he must have relied on the spiel that Old Pepper had given us in the dugout. Personally, I believe that that part of the German trench is unoccupied. Anyway, we got careless, but not so careless that we sang patriotic songs or made any unnecessary noise. During the intervals of falling star shells, we carried on with our wire cutting, until at last we succeeded in getting through the German barbed wire. At this point, we were only ten feet from the German trenches. If we were discovered, we were like rats in a trap. Our way was cut off unless we ran along the wire to the narrow lane we had cut through. With our hearts in our mouths, we waited for the three-tap signal to rush the German trench. Three taps had gotten about halfway down the line, when suddenly about ten to twenty German star shells were fired all along the trench, and landed in the barbed wire in rear of us, turning night into day and silhouetting us against the wall of light made by the flares. In the glaring light we were confronted by the following unpleasant scene. All along the German trench, at about three-foot intervals, stood a big Prussian guardsman with his rifle at the aim, and then we found out why we had not been challenged when the man sneezed and the barbed wire had been improperly cut. About three feet in front of the trench they had constructed a single fence of barbed wire, and we knew our chances were one thousand to one of returning alive. We could not rush their trench on account of this second defense. Then in front of me the challenge, HALT! given in English rang out, and one of the finest things I have ever heard on the western front took place. From the middle of our line some Tommy answered the challenge with, Ah, oh, go to hell! It must have been the man who had sneezed or who had improperly cut the barbed wire. He wanted to show Fritz that he could die game. Then came the volley. Machine guns were turned loose and several bombs were thrown in our rear. The Bosch in front of me was looking down his sight. This fellow might have, under ordinary circumstances, been handsome, but when I viewed him from the front of his rifle, he had the goblins of childhood imagination relegated to the shade. Then came a flash in front of me, the flare of his rifle, and my head seemed to burst. A bullet had hit me on the left side of my face about half an inch from my eye, smashing the cheekbones. I put my hand to my face and fell forward, biting the ground and kicking my feet. I thought I was dying, but do you know, my past life did not unfold before me the way it does in novels. The blood was streaming down my tunic, and the pain was awful. When I came to, I said to myself, Temp, old boy, you belong in Jersey City, and you better get back there as quickly as possible. The bullets were cracking overhead. I crawled a few feet back to the German barbed wire, and in a stooping position, guiding myself by the wire, I went down the line looking for the lane we had cut through. Before reaching this lane I came to a limp form which seemed like a bag of oats hanging over the wire. In the dim light I could see that its hands were blackened, and I knew it was the body of one of my mates. I put my hand on his head, the top of which had been blown off by a bomb. My fingers sank into the hole. I pulled my hand back full of blood and brains. Then I went crazy with fear and horror, and rushed along the wire until I came to our lane. I had just turned down this lane when something inside of me seemed to say, Look around. I did so. A bullet caught me on the left shoulder. It did not hurt much, just felt as if someone had punched me in the back. 
and then my left side went numb. My arm was dangling like a rag. I fell forward in a sitting position. But all fear had left me, and I was consumed with rage and cursed the German trenches. With my right hand I felt in my tunic for my first aid or shell dressing. In feeling over my tunic my hand came in contact with one of the bombs which I carried. Gripping it, I pulled the pin out with my teeth, and blindly threw it towards the German trench. I must have been out of my head, because I was only ten feet from the trench, and took a chance of being mangled. If the bomb had failed to go into the trench, I would have been blown to bits by the explosion of my own bomb. By the flare of the explosion of the bomb, which luckily landed in their trench, I saw one big Boche throw up his arms and fall backwards, while his rifle flew into the air. Another one wilted and fell forward across the sandbags. Then blackness. Realizing what a foolhardy and risky thing I had done, I was again seized with a horrible fear. I dragged myself to my feet and ran madly down the lane through the barbed wire, stumbling over cut wires, tearing my uniform, and lacerating my hands and legs. Just as I was about to reach no man's land again, that same voice seemed to say, Turn around. I did so when, crack, another bullet caught me, this time in the left shoulder about one half inch away from the other wound. Then it was taps for me. The lights went out. When I came to, I was crouching in a hole in no man's land. The shell hole was about three feet deep, so that it brought my head a few inches below the level of the ground. How I reached this hole I will never know. German typewriters were traversing back and forth in no man's land, the bullets biting the edge of my shell hole and throwing dirt all over me. Overhead, shrapnel was bursting. I could hear the fragments slap the ground. Then I went out once more. When I came to, everything was silence and darkness in no man's land. I was soaked with blood, and a big flap from the wound in my cheek was hanging over my mouth. The blood running from this flap choked me. Out of the corner of my mouth I would try and blow it back, but it would not move. I reached for my shell dressing and tried, with one hand, to bandage my face to prevent the flow. I had an awful horror of bleeding to death and was getting very faint. You would have laughed if you had seen my ludicrous attempts at bandaging with one hand. The pains in my wounded shoulder were awful, and I was getting sick at the stomach. I gave up the bandaging stunt as a bad job, and then fainted. When I came to, hell was let loose. An intense bombardment was on, and on the whole my position was decidedly unpleasant. Then, suddenly, our barrage ceased. The silence almost hurt, but not for long, because Fritz turned loose with shrapnel, machine guns, and rifle fire. Then all along our line came a cheer, and our boys came over the top in a charge. The first wave was composed of jocks. They were a magnificent sight, kilts flapping in the wind, bare knees showing, and their bayonets glistening. In the first wave that passed my shell-hole, one of the jocks, an immense fellow, about six feet two inches in height, jumped right over me. On the right and left of me, several soldiers in colored kilts were huddled on the ground. Then over came the second wave, also jocks. One young Scotty, when he came abreast of my shell-hole, leaped into the air, his rifle shooting out of his hands, landing about six feet in front of him, bayonet first, and stuck in the ground, the butt trembling. This impressed me greatly. Right now I can see the butt of that gun trembling. The Scotty made a complete turn in the air, hit the ground, rolling over twice, each time clawing at the earth, and then remained still, about four feet from me, in a sort of sitting position. I called to him, "'Are you hurt badly, Jock?' But no answer. He was dead." A dark red smudge was coming through his tunic right under his heart. The blood ran down his bare knees, making a horrible sight. On his right side he carried his water bottle. I was crazy for a drink and tried to reach this, but for the life of me could not negotiate that four feet. Then I became unconscious. When I woke up, I was in an advance first aid post. I asked the doctor if we had taken the trench. We took the trench and the wood beyond all right he said, and you fellows did your bit, but, my lad, that was thirty-six hours ago. You were lying in no man's land in that belly hole for a day and a half. It's a wonder you are alive. 
He also told me that out of the twenty that were in the raiding party, seventeen were killed. The officer died of wounds in crawling back to our trench, and I was severely wounded, but one fellow returned without a scratch, without any prisoners. No doubt this chap was the one who had sneezed and improperly cut the barbed wire. In the official communique, our trench raid was described as follows. All quiet on the western front, excepting in the neighborhood of Gumcourt Wood, where one of our raiding parties penetrated into the German lines. It is needless to say that we had no use for our persuaders or come-alongs, as we brought back no prisoners, and until I die old Pepper's words, Personally, I don't believe that that part of the German trench is occupied, will always come to me when I hear some fellow trying to get away with a fishy statement. I will judge it accordingly. End of chapter. Chapter 27 of Over the Top This LibriVox recording is in the public domain and is read by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Over the Top by Arthur Empey Chapter 27, the final chapter, entitled Blighty From this first aid post, after inoculating me with anti-tetanus serum to prevent lockjaw, I was put into an ambulance and sent to temporary hospital behind the lines. To reach this hospital we had to go along a road about five miles in length. This road was under shell fire, for now and then a flare would light up the sky, a tremendous explosion, and then the road seemed to tremble. We did not mind, though no doubt some of us wished that a shell would hit us and end our misery. Personally I was not particular. It was nothing but bump, jolt, rattle, and bang. Several times the driver would turn around and give us a, "'Cheerio, mates, we'll soon be there!' Fine fellows, those ambulance drivers. A lot of them go west, too. We gradually drew out of the fire zone and pulled up in front of an immense dugout. Stretcher-bearers carried me down a number of steps and placed me on a white table in a brightly lighted room. A sergeant of the Royal Army Medical Corps removed my bandages and cut off my tunic. Then the doctor, with his sleeves rolled up, took charge. He winked at me, and I winked back, and then he asked, "'How do you feel? Smashed up a bit?' I answered, "'I'm all right, but I'd give a quid for a drink of bass.' He nodded to the sergeant, who disappeared, and I'll be darned if he didn't return with a glass of ale. I could only open my mouth about a quarter of an inch, but I got away with every drop of that ale. It tasted just like blighty and that is heaven to Tommy. The doctor said something to an orderly. The only word I could catch was chloroform. Then they put some kind of an arrangement over my nose and mouth, and it was me for dreamland. When I opened my eyes, I was lying on a stretcher in a low wooden building. Everywhere I looked, I saw rows of Tommies on stretchers, some dead to the world, and the rest with fags in their mouths. The main topic of their conversation was blighty, Nearly all had a grin on their faces, except those who didn't have enough face left to grin with. I grinned with my right eye. The other was bandaged. Stretcher-bearers came in and began to carry the Tommies outside. You could hear the chug of the engines and the waiting ambulances. I was put into a Ford with three others, and away we went for an eighteen-mile ride. Keep out of a Ford when you are wounded. Insist on walking. It'll pay you. I was on a bottom stretcher. The lad right across from me was smashed up something horrible. Right above me was a man from the Royal Irish Rifles, while across from him was a Scotchman. We had gone about three miles when I heard the death rattle in the throat of the man opposite. He had gone to rest across the Great Divide. I think at the time I envied him. The man of the Royal Irish Rifles had had his left foot blown off, the jolting of the ambulance over the rough road had loosened up the bandages on his foot, and had started it bleeding again. His blood ran down the side of the stretcher and started dripping. I was lying on my back, too weak to move, and the dripping of this blood got in my unbandaged right eye. I closed my eye and pretty soon could not open the lid. The blood had congealed and closed it, 
as if it were glued down. An English girl dressed in khaki was driving the ambulance, while beside her on the seat was a corporal of the R.E.M.C. They kept up a running conversation about Blighty, which almost wrecked my nerves. Pretty soon from the stretcher above me, the Irishman became aware of the fact that the bandage from his foot had become loose. It must have pained him horribly, because he yelled in a loud voice, "'If you don't stop this bloody death-wagon and fix this damn bandage on my foot, I will get out and walk.' The girl on the seat turned around, and in a sympathetic voice asked, "'Poor fellow, have you been very badly wounded?' The Irishman at this question let out a howl of indignation and answered, "'Am I very badly wounded? What bloody cheek! No, I'm not wounded. I've only been kicked by a canary bird.' The ambulance immediately stopped, and the corporal came to the rear and fixed him up, and also washed out my right eye. I was too weak to thank him, but it was a great relief. Then I must have become unconscious, because when I regained my senses, the ambulance was at a standstill, and my stretcher was being removed from it. It was night. Lanterns were flashing here and there, and I could see stretcher-bearers hurrying to and fro. Then I was carried into a hospital train. The inside of this train looked like heaven to me, just pure white, and we met our first Red Cross nurses. We thought they were angels. And they were. Nice little soft bunks and clean white sheets. A Red Cross nurse sat beside me during the whole ride, which lasted three hours. She was holding my wrist. I thought I had made a hit, and tried to tell her how I got wounded. But she would put her finger to her lips and say, Yes, I know. You mustn't talk now. Try to go to sleep. It'll do you good. Doctor's orders. Later on I learned that she was taking my pulse every few minutes, as I was very weak from the loss of blood, and they expected me to snuff it, but I didn't. From the train we went into ambulances for a short ride to the hospital ship Panama. Another palace and more angels. I don't remember the trip across the channel. I opened my eyes. I was being carried on a stretcher through lanes of people, some cheering, some waving flags, and others crying. The flags were Union Jacks. I was in Southampton. Blighty at last. My stretcher was strewn with flowers, cigarettes, and chocolates. Tears started to run down my cheek from my good eye. I, like a booby, was crying. Can you beat it? Then into another hospital train, a five-hour ride to Paynton, another ambulance ride, and then I was carried into Muncie Ward of the American Women's War Hospital and put into a real bed. This real bed was too much for my unstrung nerves, and I fainted. When I came to, a pretty Red Cross nurse was bending over me, bathing my forehead with cold water. Then she left, and the ward orderly placed a screen around my bed, and gave me a much-needed bath in clean pajamas. Then the screen was removed, and a bowl of steaming soup was given me. It tasted delicious. Before finishing my soup, the nurse came back to ask me my name and number. She put this information down in a little book, and then asked, "'Where do you come from?' I answered, "'From the big town behind the Statue of Liberty.' Upon hearing this, she started jumping up and down, clapping her hands, and calling out to three nurses across the ward, "'Come here, girls! At last we've got a real live Yankee with us!' They came over and besieged me with questions, until the doctor arrived. Upon learning that I was an American, he almost crushed my hand in his grip of welcome. They also were Americans, and were glad to see me. The doctor very tenderly removed my bandages, and told me, after viewing my wounds, that he would have to take me to the operating theatre immediately. Personally, I didn't care what was done with me. In a few minutes, four orderlies who looked like undertakers dressed in white brought a stretcher to my bed, and placing me on it carried me out of the ward, across a courtyard to the operating room, or pictures, as Tommy calls it. I don't remember having the anesthetic applied. When I came to, I was again lying in a bed in Muncie Ward. One of the nurses had draped a large American flag over the head of the bed, 
and clasped in my hand was a smaller flag, and it made me feel good all over to again see the stars and stripes. At that time I wondered when the boys in the trenches would see the emblem of the land of the free and the home of the brave, beside them, doing its bit in this great war of civilization. My wounds were very painful, and several times at night I would dream that myriads of khaki-clothed figures would pass my bed, and each would stop, bend over me, and whisper, "'The best of luck, mate!' Soaked with perspiration, I would awake with a cry, and the night nurse would come over and hold my hand. This awakening got to be a habit with me, until that particular nurse was transferred to another ward. In three weeks' time, owing to the careful treatment received, I was able to sit up and get my bearings. Our ward contained seventy-five patients, ninety per cent of which were surgical cases. At the head of each bed hung a temperature chart and diagnosis sheet. Across this sheet would be written GSW, or SW, the former meaning gunshot wound, and the latter shell wound. The SW predominated, especially among the Royal Field Artillery and Royal Engineers. About forty different regiments were represented, and many arguments ensued as to the respective fighting ability of each regiment. The rivalry was wonderful. A jock arguing with an Irishman, then a strong Cockney accent would butt in in favour of a London regiment. Before long a Welshman, followed by a member of a Yorkshire regiment, and perhaps a Canadian, intrude themselves, and the argument waxes loud and furious. The patients in the bed start howling for them to settle their dispute outside, and the ward is in an uproar. The head sister comes along, and with a wave of the hand, completely routs the doughty warriors, and again silence reigns supreme. Wednesday and Sunday of each week were visiting days, and were looked forward to by the men, because they meant parcels containing fruit, sweets, or fags. When a patient had a regular visitor, he was generally kept well supplied with these delicacies. Great jealousy is shown among the men as to their visitors, and many word wars ensue after the visitors leave. When a man is sent to a convalescent home, he generally turns over his steady visitor to the man in the next bed. Most visitors have autograph albums, and bore Tommy to death by asking him to write the particulars of his wounding in same. Several Tommies try to duck this unpleasant job by telling the visitor that he cannot write, but this never phases the owner of the album. He or she, generally she, offers to write it for him, and Tommy is stung into telling his experiences. The questions asked Tommy by visitors would make a clever joke-book to a military man. Some kindly-looking old lady will stop at your bed and in a sympathetic voice address you. "'You poor boy, wounded by those terrible Germans! You must be suffering frightful pain. A bullet, did you say? Well, tell me. I have always wanted to know. Did it hurt worse going in or coming out?' Tommy generally replies that he did not stop to figure it out when he was hit. One very nice-looking, over-enthusiastic young thing stopped at my bed and asked, "'What wounded you in the face?' In a polite but bored tone I answered, "'A rifle bullet.' With a look of disdain she passed to the next bed, first ejaculating, "'Oh, only a bullet? I thought it was a shell.' Why she should think a shell wound was more of a distinction beats me. I don't see a whole lot of difference myself. The American Women's War Hospital was a heaven for wounded men. They were allowed every privilege possible conducive with the rules and military discipline. The only fault was that the men's passes were restricted. To get a pass required an act of Parliament. Tommy tried many tricks to get out, but the Commandant, an old Boer War officer, was wise to them all, and it took a new and clever ruse to make him affix his signature to the coveted slip of paper. As soon as it would get dark, many a patient climbed over the wall and went on his own, regardless of many signs staring him in the face, out of bounds for patients. Generally the nurses were looking the other way when one of these night raids started. I hope this information will get none of them into trouble, 
but I cannot resist the temptation to let the Commandant know that occasionally we put it over on him. One afternoon I received a note, through our underground channel, from my female visitor, asking me to attend a party at her house that night. I answered that she could expect me, and to meet me at a certain place on the road well known by all patients, and some visitors, as over the wall. I told her I would be on hand at seven-thirty. About seven-fifteen I sneaked my overcoat and cap out of the ward and hid it in the bushes. Then I told the nurse, a particular friend of mine, that I was going for a walk in the rose garden. She winked, and I knew that everything was all right on her end. Going out of the ward, I slipped into the bushes and made for the wall. It was dark as pitch, and I was groping through the underbrush, when suddenly I stepped into space and felt myself rushing downward, a horrible bump and blackness. When I came to, my wounded shoulder was hurting horribly. I was lying against a circular wall of bricks, dripping with moisture, and far away I could hear the trickling of water. I had in the darkness fallen into an old disused well. But why wasn't I wet? According to all rules, I should have been drowned. Perhaps I was and didn't know it. As the shock of my sudden stop gradually wore off, it came to me that I was lying on a ledge, and that the least movement on my part would precipitate me to the bottom of the well. I struck a match. In its faint glare I saw that I was lying in a circular hole about twelve feet deep. The well had been filled in. The dripping I had heard came from a water-pipe over on my right. With my wounded shoulder it was impossible to shinny up the pipe. I could not yell for help, because the rescuer would want to know how the accident happened, and I would be hailed before the commandant on charges. I just had to grin and bear it with the forlorn hope that one of the returning night raiders would pass, and I could give him our usual signal of sss, which would bring him to the rescue. Every half hour I could hear the clock in the village strike, each stroke bringing forth a muffled volley of curses on the man who had dug the well. After two hours I heard two men talking in low voices. I recognized Corporal Cook, an ardent night raider. He heard my sss and came to the edge of the hole. I explained my predicament, and amid a lot of impertinent remarks, which at the time I did not resent, I was soon fished out. Taking off our boots, we sneaked into the ward. I was sitting on my bed in the dark, just starting to undress, when the man next to me, Ginger Phillips, whispered, "'Up it, Yank! Here comes the matron!' I immediately got under the covers and feigned sleep. The matron stood talking in low tones to the night nurse, and I fell asleep. When I awoke in the morning, the night sister, an American, was bending over me. An awful sight met my eyes. The coverlet on the bed and the sheets were a mass of mud and green slime. She was good sport, all right, and hustled to get clean clothes and sheets so that no one would get wise, but on her own she gave me a good tongue-lashing but did not report me. One of the Canadians in the ward described her as being a Jake of a good fellow. Next visiting day I had an awful time explaining to my visitor why I had not met her at the appointed time and place, and for a week every time I passed a patient he would call, "'Well, well, here's the yank. Hope you're feeling well, old top.' The surgeon in our ward was an American, a Harvard unit man named Frost. We nicknamed him Jack Frost. He was loved by all. If a Tommy was to be cut up, he had no objection to undergoing the operation if Jack Frost was to wield the knife. Their confidence in him was pathetic. He was the best sport I have ever met. One Saturday morning the Commandant and some high-up officers were inspecting the ward, when one of the patients who had been wounded in the head by a bit of shrapnel fell on the floor in a fit. They brought him round, and then looked for the ward orderly to carry the patient back to his bed at the other end of the ward. The orderly was nowhere to be found. Like our policemen, they never are when needed. The officers were at a loss how to get Palmer into his bed. Dr. Frost was fidgeting around in a nervous manner, when suddenly, with a muffled damn, 
and a few other qualifying adjectives, he stooped down and took the man in his arms like a baby, he was no feather either, and staggered down the ward with him, put him in bed, and undressed him. A low murmur of approval came from the patients. Dr. Frost got very red, and as soon as he had finished undressing Palmer, hurriedly left the ward. The wound in my face had almost healed, and I was a horrible-looking sight. The left cheek twisted into a knot, the eye pulled down, and my mouth pointing in a north-by-northwest direction. I was very downhearted, and could imagine myself during the rest of my life being shunned by all on account of the repulsive scar. Dr. Frost arranged for me to go to the Cambridge Military Hospital at Aldershot for a special operation to try and make the scar presentable. I arrived at the hospital and got an awful shock. The food was poor and the discipline abnormally strict. No patient was allowed to sit on his bed, and smoking was permitted only at certain designated hours. The face specialist did nothing for me except to look at the wound. I made application for a transfer back to Paynton, offering to pay my transportation. This offer was accepted, and after two weeks' absence, once again I arrived in Muncie Ward, all hope gone. The next day, after my return, Dr. Frost stopped at my bed and said, well, Empey, if you want me to try and see what I can do with that scar, I'll do it, but you are taking an awful chance. I answered, Well, doctor, Steve Brody took a chance. He hails from New York, and so do I. Two days after the undertaker squad carried me to the operating room, or pictures, as we called them because of the funny films we see under ether, and the operation was performed. It was a wonderful piece of surgery and a marvellous success. From now on that doctor can have my shirt. More than once some poor soldier has been brought into the ward in a dying condition, resulting from loss of blood and exhaustion caused by his long journey from the trenches. After an examination the doctor announces that the only thing that will save him is a transfusion of blood. Where is the blood to come from? He does not have to wait long for an answer. Several Tommies immediately volunteer their blood for their mate. Three or four are accepted, a blood test is made, and next day the transfusion takes place, and there is another pale face in the ward. Whenever bone is needed for some special operation, there are always men willing to give some, a leg if necessary to save some mangled mate from being crippled for life. More than one man will go through life with another man's blood running through his veins, or a piece of his rib or his shin-bone, in his own anatomy. Sometimes he never even knows the name of his benefactor. The spirit of sacrifice is wonderful. For all the suffering caused, this war is a blessing to England. It has made new men of her sons, has welded all classes into one glorious whole. And I can't help saying that the doctors, sisters, and nurses in the English hospitals are angels on earth. I love them all, and can never repay the care and kindness shown to me. For the rest of my life the Red Cross will be to me the symbol of faith, hope, and charity. After four months in the hospital, I went before an examining board and was discharged from the service of His Britannic Majesty as physically unfit for further war service. After my discharge I engaged passage on the American liner, New York, and after a stormy trip across the Atlantic, one momentous day, in the haze of early dawn, I saw the Statue of Liberty looming over the port rail, and I wondered if ever again I would go over the top with the best of luck and give them hell. And even then, though it may seem strange, I was really sorry not to be back in the trenches with my mates. War is not a pink tea, but in a worthwhile cause like ours, mud, rats, cooties, shells, wounds, or death itself, are far outweighed by the deep sense of satisfaction felt by the man who does his bit. There is one thing which my experience taught me that might help the boy who may have to go. It is this. Anticipation is far worse than realization. In civil life a man stands in awe of the man above him, wonders how he could ever fill his job. When the time comes he rises to the occasion, 
is up and at it, and is surprised to find how much more easily than he anticipated he fills his responsibilities. It is really so, out there. He has nerve for the hardships, the interest of the work grips him. He finds relief in the fun and comradeship of the trenches, and wins that best sort of happiness that comes with duty done. End of chapter, end of book. Thank you for listening.